552,830. That's a really big number. For example, it's the number of people that live in Tucson, Arizona. Sadly, it's also a, co a really uh, conservative number of the number of people who experienced homelessness in the United States in 2018 on any one given night. Hidden in that number is a lot of pain and anguish and anxiety. It's a difficult situation. If you live in Los Angeles or New York or, or um, San Francisco, you see homelessness a lot on your live in their cars. Some people are sleeping on sofas, so it's a little bit less hidden, or a less evident, that is. It's particularly troublesome when we see photos like this, where our wealthy society is juxtaposed against terrific need. The situation is really, really interesting, and it's a wicked problem, because homelessness is so wrapped up with so many other social ills. Drug abuse, poverty, crime, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, mental illness, all of those things have connections to homelessness. The lack of affordable housing is a huge problem with homelessness as well. The other problem with homelessness is that it does not discriminate. Nearly every type of person we might know could be affected by homelessness. Elderly people, veterans, adolescents aging out of the foster care system, single men and women, yes, but also tragically families are very often afflicted by homelessness. It's a terrible problem we need to address. It's also something that's wrapped up with stigma. For example, if somebody loses the water service at their house, people around them will be pretty sympathetic and they will say, gee, you lost your water. But if somebody loses their home, sometimes an entirely different persona is placed on them. They might be seen as lazy or morally deficient, even though, of course, that's not the case. So stigma is half the problem in addition to the physical loss of your house, shelter, meals, and food, and so forth and so on. So, why should we care about this? Well, one thing that is very interesting to know that not everybody does is that if a person is living in the forest or living on the streets year-round, they may be costing their community between 30 and 50,000 of taxpayer dollars per year in park service police protection, hospital services, ambulance services, and so forth. What's more, if a child becomes homeless early in their life, they may actually um, experience a learning disability that can last their entire life, which also costs their community. An interesting thought experiment was done a few years ago. Uh, by a CEO of a company who provides water and sewer services to very impoverished um, uh, populations around the world. And he found this out, which I was really interested in. There are about 2.1 billion people that live in extreme poverty worldwide. Of those, about 730 million of them statistically likely have IQs between that of Bill Gates and Leonardo da Vinci. Of those 730, about 200 million probably have what we would call superior intelligence. And strikingly, of those, perhaps 70,000 might be as smart as Einstein. Now, about that. What is the cost to our society as a whole with this loss of potential? Because many people in the world are just simply having to spend their time in cognitive energy wondering where their next meal or where they're sleeping that night. So there's a staggering cost to us all that I think bears thinking about. Now it's really easy to become really traumatized by this and paralyzed by this. In my role as a researcher and a teacher, I'm very interested in interior environments, interior design and architecture, the places around us the walls, the sofas, the windows, the doors, and so forth, and what roles those play. And I'm becoming increasingly convinced that built environment has a total role to play in this, that we're maybe not leveraging enough. So I think that's something that we need to explore. So what I'd like to do today is share with you some ideas that I've come across from others, 
and also some new and very startling understandings that are making us totally rethink really what the things around us impact and make us believe about others and about ourselves. And that's worth thinking about. So I'd like to share some stories with you. Um, in my research, I quite often interview people who are recently homeless and are living in shelters or supportive housing. For example, I interviewed a woman in this particular uh, room that you see. And she was newly in the shelter, had an infant daughter that was very young with her. She was in her 20s. And of the many questions I ask, one thing I often um, say is, if there's anything you could need in this moment of crisis in your life with regard to built environment, what would it be? And her answer really surprised me. She told me she wanted a piece of scotch tape. And I said, what in the world do you want a piece of scotch tape for? And what she said really surprised me. She said, I want a piece of scotch tape so that I can tape my Florida State University College of Law degree to the wall to remind me of my past achievements. Now, in that moment, two things occurred to me. First of all, there's not very many steps between where she is and where I am. And maybe my position is not as secure as I might think. And secondly, I started to think, well, maybe there's a lot more to the experience of homelessness than just having a place to sleep and your next meal um, coming your way. So again, I think there's more going on here than we might think, and that's really important. So simply put, places, things, objects that form experiences may be affecting us more than we think they are, and in that there is great opportunity. In fact, neuroscientists and psychologists are telling us that we sort of process our experience of life as feelings. What our bodies literally feel is what's in, impacting how we see the world and so forth. Um, for example, place yourself in this scene. It's in the morning. You're enjoying a warm cup of coffee. The mug is warm in your hand. The, the morning sun is streaming in. And you're enjoying a great moment of laughter with your partner over something you watched on television last night. All the ingredients are there for a really nice experience that you're really enjoying. In fact, it's so strong, several days later, when you pick up that coffee cup, you still remember that, and you smile to yourself. Psychologists call that a schema. It's a whole series of things that came together to make you feel a certain way. And it's done through associations with coffee cups and sunbeams and those kinds of things. Well, not all associations may be positive, especially if you happen to be homeless. Let's for, imagine for a moment that you are homeless because you've just been kicked out of your apartment because they just raised the rent. And your salary no longer supports you living in that apartment with uh, your three young sons. So you end up living in a space like this. So this is where you are for the next six to 12 months as you develop a plan to exit homelessness and so forth. You're also very pregnant and therefore a little bit uh, in pain sometimes and so forth. So let's further imagine that you're walking down the hall and you're coming to where your apartment is and the footsteps and so forth are very, very echoey in this hallway because all the surfaces are very, very hard. You get to your door and your neighbor is playing a screaming guitar music again and your sons are arguing. They're arguing over who knows what. And now your infant comes in together too. Your hands clench, your eyes close, you have a headache and your back hurts and you realize you are homeless with all of the hopelessness and helplessness that that means. As a result, you lash out at your sons in ways that you soon learn to regret. Psychologists would say that you have actually been primed by the experiences to have acted in that way. Well, what's also really interesting, and even a step beyond that, is that psychologists suggest that spaces and experiences and sofas and beds and music and loudness and so forth can actually, in fact, make us feel a particular way about ourselves. And I had a really interesting brush with this when I interviewed somebody else. A woman was living in an apartment. She had uh, just moved into her apartment. She was just been homeless. And the apartment was very small. And it wasn't very well equipped so that her stuff was everywhere. 
She had tables full of aspirin bottles and grocery lists and dirty laundry and you know, pots and pans and everything was everywhere. And she was really agitated that day when I met with her. And I asked her why. And she said, yesterday I missed a key appointment that could have gotten me a job that could have gotten me out of homelessness permanently. And what she said about that really struck me. She said, I missed the appointment because I couldn't find the piece of paper that the um, appointment had been written on. And then what she said next really struck me. She said, it reminded me by me, me not being able to find that piece of paper that I could not get it together as a person. So she had internalized all of this visual chaos around her and her environment, not able to really make her get organized by, and she had equated it to how she felt personally. So there's something very interesting going on with built environment and how it makes us feel about others and even about ourselves. And I think that's very powerful. So what can we do with that? If we look around, we could look, for example, at encampments. This one happens to be in Portland, Oregon. And if you uh, were to interview some of the people there, you would tragically find that a number of our, th them are there because there's not enough affordable housing. Again, it's a terrible problem. But some others will tell you that they don't want to go to an available shelter because they perceive it as dirty, or it might be a little violent. It may or may not be true. But interestingly, a number of them would also tell you that they do not want to go into a shelter because they do not want to be told where to, do, where to go and what to do. They don't want to lose their, auton their autonomy. So there's something we might look at with our policies, programs, and the environments of shelters, supportive housing, and day centers. And something is not clicking with people that they are instead braving wind and cold and you know, terrible hardship living outside in flimsy tents in order to avoid. So I think that's a problem we need to absolutely look at. What if we looked at this instead as the whole person in terms of helping somebody to exit homelessness quickly and effectively with their dignity? I think there's things that we might be able to do with this. I think there are things that move beyond pretty. This is not about prettying up um, buildings or interiors. This is a way beyond that, and this is looking at how to provide somebody mental and physical space in order to breathe de-stress and to be able to exit homelessness. And I think that is where interior design and architecture has some great leverage for, for us all and so forth. So I want to share with you um, some other ideas going on in social work and psychology, and this is just perfectly timed. Because for many years, when a person has been homeless, they are greeted with policies and so forth that were very top-down and very, you need to do this then and that. And, you know, in a shelter they might be told when to eat and where to sleep and those kinds of things. And it was promoting some helplessness, which is a terrible problem. These days, though, there's a new movement called trauma-informed care, which is turning that entirely on its head, 180 degrees, and instead um, building dignity and empowerment and self-determination and choice. What if we took that idea and then we transported that into the built environment to trauma-informed design? I believe that's the next step. That's the next ingredient so that we could leverage interior design and architecture to its fullest amount. So I'd like to share with you um, some places I've been across the country with my research and writing, looking at other places already built to see if there are ways they are, in fact, starting to promote dignity and so forth, and there are. So I've been to Los Angeles, I've been to Texas, I've been to New York City, I've been to San Francisco, and just recently to the United Kingdom, looking at ideas that we can share and spread to other places. And I found some very interesting things out that I want to point out to you. This is a Victims of Domestic Violence uh, permanent supportive housing located in Seattle. And as you see here, uh, women live in small little single occupancy pods. The, the walls are only 50 inches tall. But the women like it that way because they like being nearby other women to know that they feel protected. So we may want, not want to live like that, but they like it just fine. But I'm particularly taken by that sign you see in the bottom left there. That's a stop and go sign that the residents came up with themselves. 
and it's a sign you can change to either stop or go to let somebody know whether you want to accept a visitor at that time or not. So giving that resident a little bit of choice over how exposed they are to other people coming in, because we all know sometimes there's times we really don't want to talk to other people. Another issue is many times in shelters, beds, bunk beds specifically, will be in groups of 40 or 60. And they're very, very um, anonymous. In fact, they often have a number on them so that uh, you can be directed to the bed you're sleeping in that night. But if you look carefully at this bed, you'll see a tiny little sticky note. And a resident that night had taken it upon himself to write his name on that sticky note because I suspect he didn't want to be a number. I think he wanted to be a person. So what if we took that idea and actually ran with it and created intentional signs, chalkboards even, that somebody could simply write their name on it that night in order to get to know who might be your neighbor below or beside you and so forth and maybe build a friendship because isolation is one of the hugest enemies of exiting homelessness well. Or what if we looked at beds and gave um, people privacy because a bed is the only private place somebody has in a shelter. And don't we all know, sometimes you just want to get away from other family members. So what if we uh, had some draw curtains, maybe a light to read in bed or do homework and so forth, in order to give somebody a little bit more agency and a little bit more choice in that space. We also can think about lighting. I'm a big fan of lighting and what it can do. In fact, you see a picture of me on the right here. And if you look carefully, you'll see all kinds of wrinkles on my face and bags under my eyes and shadows under my nose. And I don't look very great, OK? I'm standing in front of the uh, vanity you see on the left there. And the lighting's straight overhead, and it's giving me some harsh shadows on my face. Well, compare that with this one. All we've done is we've moved the lighting down to either side of the mirror given a little bit of thought to the color of the light, and all of a sudden, you don't see the wrinkles in my face so much. <laughs> Happily. Um, the shadows are missing under my nose, and un the bags under my eyes have mysteriously disappeared. All we've done is we've moved the lighting. There's really not much difference in price between lighting A and lighting B. So just some very interesting and small things we can do that can really attend to dignity and self-esteem very well. So I've just shared with you a few messages. For example, if we compare these two, let's say that I am homeless and I have to go out for an interview that next day. And I get up in the morning in the shelter and I'm looking at myself on the left or the right. I think you might agree with me that I would think better of myself if I were to be on the right. So I think small things can make big differences and we need to really move toward that. So I've shared with you just a few messages. And those messages send a, a, a signal of care, or not care, respect or disrespect. Things that we can do that are very easy to do. And I think some of these things and others are embodied in this idea of trauma-informed design. Were we to affect trauma-informed design, we could in turn leverage interior design and architecture and ultimately start to empower people to rejoin our society to make us the best that we can be. Thank you.